Good morning. Thanks, Afsane. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Asia Pacific Statistics Cafe. We're back to doing these on a Monday, so that's great. So for those that don't know me, I'm Rachel Bevan. I'm Director of Statistics Division here at UNSCAP. And for today's Asia Pacific Stats Cafe, we're looking at unlocking the value of data for all. And we probably all know that over the last few years, we've seen a huge proliferation in the availability of data and statistics, but we really have not seen uh, that same kind of use being made of that data by policymakers. And we often see this kind of mismatch between how much data is available and how much is actually really being used to affect decisions. So today we're going to be looking at this topic and looking at how we can unlock the value of data for everyone. And as ever, we're going to hear a range of different perspectives on this topic. So I'd like to start as well by saying an apology. I'm really sorry that I have to leave the session early today because I have a clash with another meeting. However, I am glad to say that as ever, this session is being recorded, which means I will definitely be watching it back afterwards, but just also a reminder to everyone, it's being recorded, so just let us know if that's an issue. Um, and the timing of this session as well is really fantastic. I was looking on my kind of Twitter feed last week and I saw that uh, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data just released their new report on looking at the whole issue of data and power and looking at the value of data, which, and I have printed out the report and I printed it because I really want to read it and take some time to absorb it. But I apologise, I haven't read it all in advance of this cafe today. But I'm very pleased that our moderator today, who's going to be telling us more about that, is Ms Martina Babaro, and she's the policy manager for the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, and she works on advancing our pol the policy work on kind of looking at the public use of privately held data. She also looks at data sharing partnerships and has been doing work on the governance of data. So she will tell you more about that. Um, and I'm going to leave this session in her very capable hands and she will introduce the main topics and the speakers. But thanks very much. Over to you, Martina. Thank you very much, Rachel, for this great introduction. And indeed, this discussion is really timely. The question of use of data is now more important than ever. We're reaching the 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals deadlines. So we want data to be put at use to make sure that we meet these commitments. I'm really pleased to be here today. I will be your host. Uh, before we get started and we dig into the topic, just a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, uh, you can post your question in the chat all along this discussion. We will have some introduction and uh, introductory remarks from the panelists and then we will go into a Q&A mode. So if you have questions, do not hesitate to share them in the chat and we will try to pick them up. If we don't manage to answer to all the questions, we will try to address them afterwards after this, uh, this event is, um, is concluded. And the second house, housekeeping point concerned the, um, uh, the recording, which indeed, as Rachel already mentioned, will be available immediately after the uh, session. You can also check the Stats Cafe webpage for more information on the speakers, for the presentation that will be shared afterwards as well. So now it's time to go into the first um, presentation and to kick us off today we have a presentation from uh, Shruti. Uh, Shruti she's, uh, uh, le she leads Athena Infonomics governance and technology practice and has over 10 years of experience in digital governance and service delivery. Her work has focused on effective and efficient delivery of social programs through technology adoption, assessing organizational digital capacity and research, research on digital governance. Shruti has worked with the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data in promoting sustained institutional data use. She has a degree in law from the National Law School of India and a Master in Development Economics and Human Security from the Fletcher School. So Shruti is here today to share a bit more about this Data Values project that Rachel has just introduced to you and uh, especially highlight how this project from the Global Partnership 
partnership thought about uh, data use um, and uh, what are the key learnings and recommendations that can be um, uh, derived from that work. Uh, after Shruti's presentation, we will go into panel mode. Uh, Shruti, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Martina, I, uh, for that very kind introduction. I am switching off my camera just to save some bandwidth, uh, but hopefully this should still work. Let me know if there are any issues in hearing me or understanding. Okay. So like Martina mentioned, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so briefly talking about our work with the Data Values Project and some of the... And some of the key recommendations and findings that are coming out of it. Like Martina mentioned, I lead the governance and technology work at Athena Infonomics. I'm based in Chennai in India. And at Athena, we look at combining data, technology, and social science research to drive innovation in policy and programming. Over the past year, we've worked with Martina and the GPSDD team on the Data Values Project. So the Data Values Project is primarily a policy advocacy campaign with the main aim of developing a common agenda for data norms, rights, and governance issues, and hoping that these norms, rights, and issues find resonance and are embedded within decision makers at the national, regional, and global level. So, Data Values Project is led by the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data's Technical Advisory Group. Over the past year, they've brought together organizations across the globe. This includes donors, governments, civil society organizations, private sector implementers to exchange ideas around data governance and develop some knowledge products around it. This includes blog posts, long form publications, events, fireside chats, and the Data Values Digest. All of this information is available on the Data Values Project website. On this slide are some of the key outcomes of the project. We're right now at the left end with the white paper outlining a summary of the consultations and key recommendations. And we're, what we're hoping is these recommendations find resonance within data values and data practices and can be embedded into actions amongst different stakeholders across the globe. The Data Values Project is broadly divided into three main themes, agency in data, accountability in data governance, and data in action. Agency in data centers people's voices, perspectives, and ensuring that they are reflected in data and building systems for inclusive approaches that are not afterthoughts, but are rooted within how we collect, analyze, think about data. Accountability in data governance is the second theme. And I, I mean, the title itself is pretty self-explanatory. It looks at accountability of decision makers within the data governance system and how participatory mechanisms and feedback loops can be built into data governance. The final theme, data in action, will really form the focus of my presentation today and we'll be focusing on the recommendations that are emerging from that. I mean, one thing that's central across this theme is that a recognition that the potential exists for data to change development outcomes and hopefully uh, address power imbalances and hopefully that it's used to make better, more fairer policies for everyone. However, there's a recognition also that this kind of evidence-based decision making requires high quality data. It requires data to be collected regularly and it requires timely data. And Today, while we've greatly improved our ability on the computational end of things, that's we're able to collect and analyze a lot more data than we were able to even a decade ago, much of this data often remains unused or underutilized. A central theme of the data in action work is the centrality of human factors in impacting data use. 
individuals motivations, their incentives or lack of incentives to use data, their capacity and skills to understand, analyze data and institutional and organizational incentives that promote data sharing and data use. These factors we find often receive a lot less attention than technical questions that are related to, let's say, data quality, even though these human and institutional factors seem to have a much greater influence on whether data is used at all and how it's used. Of course, these human factors are much harder to identify and they're even more difficult to fix. But if you're serious about building a culture of sustained effective data use, then we cannot shy away from these human factors. I'll sort of use an example to uh, highlight this. Through our work, we looked at a case study in Timor-Leste where an a transparency portal was created to develop transparency and accountability around development projects and different development projects that were taking place in the country. Different stakeholders agreed that there was a need for this data, that they did want access to this data, did want to understand what was happening in the development space. But a follow-up study found that actually the portal itself was used rather sparingly. There were some issues related to internet servers. They also found that the reports were often published in English and Portuguese and not in the local Tetum. But what they did find is there was greater trust with locally relevant data, which was delivered by fostering relationships with government officials, implementing partners, civil society organizations, rather than the data that was being presented on the portal. Thus, despite widespread demand for data, the portal didn't seem to be the solution. And what we hope emerges Sorry, there is a lot of echo. I think it's muted now. Sorry about that. Um, but what we hope everyone takes away from this presentation today is that it's individuals and institutions, not a data platform, not a dashboard, not an application that's at the heart of data sharing and use. In the next few slides, I'll look at recommendations for different stakeholders on how to promote effective and sustained data use and how to build a culture of data use with this central tenet in mind. We're looking at recommendations for government stakeholders, for multilaterals and donors, for civil society organizations and private sectors. A key finding that emerged from the consultations was there was a lot of data silos within government departments and a reluctance to share data across departments. And this led to a duplication of data collection efforts. Sometimes the same data was being collected over and over again, often by the same frontline workers. So I'll use an example from India where maternal maternity data around pregnancy, around institutional birth, etc., was relevant both uh, to the Department of Health and the Department of Child Welfare and Women's Development. So the same data could be used by both departments but was being collected by the local health worker in two different formats for two different schemes and being sent to these different departments. So a key recommendation that emerges for government departments and agencies is promoting cultures of data sharing and use and reducing the duplication of data collection efforts. Also important was identifying and investing in relevant roles and skills that would improve data use. Again, I'll use an example from India to highlight this. We looked at a scheme where there was a cash transfer for certain beneficiaries and a digital monitoring system had been set up to identify beneficiaries, check their adherence to the scheme conditions and identify a list that would then get a direct benefit transfer. Unfortunately, what happened is the data for the beneficiaries was being collected by paper uh, by the local health line work, frontline worker. There was a digital monitoring system that could use this data to make decisions around who got the benefit, but there was nobody to take that paper data and translate in or put input it into the digital monitoring system. The scheme had forgotten to budget for a data entry operator. So what happened 
was very ad hoc entries, which led to massive delays and errors in the beneficiaries receiving their transfers from the government. So identifying the roles, the skills that are necessary, and investing in the acquisition of this to promote data use within governments is important, and promoting data and information literacy amongst the larger population. Our next set of recommendations focuses on donors and international organizations. A, a common theme that emerged across different geographies that sometimes data was collected merely to satisfy a donor's checklist. So data collection itself became the ultimate aim of the process, not the analysis and the use of the data that was being collected. So a key recommendation here is aligning projects and goals with local priorities and committing to longer term horizons for funding. We found that often data monitoring and collection systems were project based with a three to five or to seven year funding horizon. And what emerged was the need to invest in sustainable longer term data ecosystems that transcended a project timeline. Also important was strengthening the data related competencies of the donor staff themselves. Our consultation suggested that many data roles in donor organizations were filled by lawyers, policymakers, uh, governance advisors, economists, people like me uh, actually, but people with uh, less of an understanding of the technical requirements for building a data ecosystem whether uh, this be data scientists, data engineers, data architects, who could lead and contribute to technical conversations around building data ecosystems. So building this capacity within donor staff so that more specific conversations around the technical data ecosystem could be had. The private sector also emerged as a key participant within the data use ecosystem useful data, skills, and capacities, and innovations are emerging from the private sector. And often they are the implementing partners in large public sector data projects. We found contracts of building data management systems, data monitoring systems, often given to large private sector companies. And therefore it becomes important to acknowledge the power that they wield as active contributors to a fair data future. You'll see on that slide that recommendations for private companies largely focus on engaging in cross-sectoral partnerships, ensuring transfer of technology and skills from the private to the public sector, and building user-centric and participatory approaches when they think about building products, services, and systems. The last set of recommendations really focused on civil society organizations. And you know, civil society organizations play this unique dual role where they are partners to governments, to donors, but they're also advocates for the communities that they are working on. And our recommendations for civil society organizations focused on pushing for greater representation in data production, in promoting institutional transparency and accountability, and in building data literacy skills. And to be honest, in some ways, I feel the recommendations for CSOs are you know, the broadest and most difficult to implement, but also a reflection of the pivotal role that they play both for communities and for improving transparency within governments and institutions. While the consultations identified several challenges, several recommendations, what was common across different stakeholders was also a belief that together these groups, that is CSOs, private sector, the government and donors, have the power to create more just, more equitable data systems to promote collection, inclusive collection of data, to promote thoughtful use of this data, and build more equitable communities and truly unlock the power of data for all people. I will now hand it off to Martina to discuss feedback and next steps. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Shruti, for this excellent presentation and for setting the scene. We're going to go in the panel discussion in a moment, but just before we do that, if you are interested in sharing your views uh, on the topics that Shruti just presented and on these messages on around the, uh, the data use and data values, uh, please be aware that there is a public consultation on the paper, um, on the white paper from which uh, Shruti um, uh, extracted some key messages, and we would be delighted to hear from you. I will post the uh, link uh, to the consultation in the chat. You have until the 20th of May to, to share your thoughts, and we hope that um, you will be able to inform our next steps and let us know what you think about uh, these key messages. We now uh, are heading towards the panel discussion. I will put the panel discussion question on the screen and let me introduce our first panelist, Mr. Batva. Mr. Batva is the, is the appointed chairman of the National Statistical Office of Mongolia since January 2021. Before his appointment, he served as the Director General of Research and Statistics Department, Markets Department, and Balance of Payment Research and Statistics Division of the Bank of Mongolia. He earned his master's degree in banking and finance from the Luxembourg School of Finance, University of Luxembourg. And he also has a bachelor degree in business administration from Ming Chuan University, Taiwan. He has earned his Chartered Financial Analyst Charter Holder in September 2019, and we're very excited to hear from him as we dig further into the role of national statistical offices for, for data use. Um, Mr. Batva, the, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Martina, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express our gratitude for allowing uh, our participation in this event. So with regards to the first question, what's the role of the National Statistics Office in embedding data use in uh, decision making? I would say, first of all, the National Statistical Offices shall, shall be, you know, focus on the timeliness and quality of the data as it, it is suggested in the fundamental principles of the official statistics. And, uh, which has become uh, uh, more important during the COVID-19 pan pandemic because the data need for, uh, during the pandemic has increased uh, quite significantly, not only here in Mongolia, but internationally. So we have to, you know, uh, our whole our business again to improve the timeliness of the data to increase the data use in the decision making process. Secondly, I would say, uh, uh, the NSOs shall be more proactive in promoting the data use in the decision making. This is especially important because uh, traditionally the way we think ourselves is that the, the official policy making and statistical production has been uh, segregated uh, uh, for long. But uh, when we are active in the policy making, when we are there in the cabinet meeting of the government or, the, or in the parliament, when they are passing the law, we shall be there to provide them with the necessary data or the relevant data. Because uh, most of the time, uh, the lawmakers or the cabinet members does not ha have the the full picture of the uh, what kind of indicators the NSOs produce uh, at what time intervals. So uh, the representatives from the National Statistics Office, uh, by participating there in more an active way, could increase the use of the data in the decision making. Thirdly, I would say uh, we should promote uh, uh, the general uh, data lit literacy among our citizens, as uh, uh, Shurete said uh, during his presentation. As for this uh, endeavor, uh, I would say that uh, the National Statistics Office of Mongolia has started a program, program of uh, for data literacy among the journalists, the staff of the Secretariat of the Parliament, and also the, also the line ministries. And uh, this is especially important because most of the time, the Parliament Secretariat and the Government Secretariat, they are mostly the lawyers working, uh, uh, which has a, who have a different profession, who are not in the experts in the data. So like basic trainings, including where to find the necessary data and uh, how to interpret the data was uh, quite uh, useful for them to, you know, 
uh, formulate uh, uh, the policy making and, and increase the data usage. And uh, I think the one of the most uh, you know common examples of the barriers which hinder the data usage usage in uh, decision making is uh, the data literacy itself. Most of the time, the line ministries or the parliament secretariats, uh, as I said, uh, they don't know where to find the specific indicators. So uh, the initial training or the, the, the training for like uh, finding necessary data and interpretation of data is very helpful for them. That's uh, at least what we have found uh, ourselves. And uh, in terms of the multi-stakeholder approach to help the help drive effective and sustain sustained data use, I think uh, uh, in our case, uh, what we have been, been suggesting that our partners, including the IFIs and also the UN system organizations, is that uh, we should place more emphasis on the data e ecosystem and its governance at the national level here in Mongolia to increase the, the governance issue and then the capacity of the, the data stewards at the different line ministries to increase the quality and the timeliness of the data and increase the uh, ecosystem and interoperability of the data. I think uh, this will help the, uh, the increasing need for the uh, this will help solve the increasing net need for the more granular and disaggregated data that's uh, becoming more and more, more important uh, in this age of the digital transitions. And uh, I think for sustained data use by decision maker, makers, I think uh, my most important thing is uh, the, the promotion of the data literacy, especially the uh, what is the official statistics and what what is this other survey? What is the census and where the finding the necessary data? Like simple things like this will really helps in our case. Our to you, Martina. Thank you very much for sharing this excellent point. I retain from from your points to step up role to really help embed data use in decision making practices. So it's uh, it's important that the National Statistical Office participate in making sure that data is used, and also this strong focus on data literacy and the importance of of data literacy for data use. So I think those are um, key messages that resonate with what Shruti presented in terms of the human factors being often the key barriers uh, for data use rather than the technological factors. I think we will get back to you with more questions afterwards, but thank you very much for the moment, Mr. Batva. And we can now move to Mr. Gojita uh, Todradze. Uh, Mr. Gojita Todradze, he is the um, um, the Executive Director of National Statistics Office of Georgia. He has been working in various positions in the National Statistics Office of Georgia, Geostat, since 2002. He was the Head of Business Statistics Division from 2010 to 2016 and the Deputy Executive Director from 2016 to 2018. Since November 2017, he has been a member of the Business Statistics Expert Group of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNESE. In addition, he has served as a member and then the chair of the Bureau of the Committee, Committee on Statistics of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific UNESCAP since November 2018. Mr. Todratze holds higher education qualification in the field of economics, statistics and legal studies. He has received his PhD in economics in 2006 and he speaks English, German and Russian. I think it's very, we are eager to hear from you and see another perspective from another national statistical office. So Mr. Todratze, the, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Martina. It is my uh, honor and great pleasure to express my sincere appreciation uh, to the distinguished delegates of today's meeting and to greet uh, all of you. Allow me to express my gratitude to the UNS, UNS Cup Statistical Division for organizing this uh, 
really important meeting and for having the opportunity to reflect my opinion. Uh, in terms of first question uh, about the role of uh, NSOs in embedding data use in decision making, uh, I'd like to mention that official statistics are an indispensable element of the information system of a democratic society serving a broad range of uh, users, uh, including government, uh, politicians, uh, scientific society, business associations, media and the public with uh, data about the economic, uh, demographic, social and environmental conditions of the country. Uh, the goal and main priorities of a national statistical system actually are uh, to produce high quality, timely and relevant official statistics in an effective manner based on user needs to support a good decision-making process and to enhance public accountability based on the core values of official statistics. Uh, the NSO should enhance their methods uh, to increase transparency and availability of data through improving data clarity, data distribution channels, and communication with users. Uh, there is a very long list of needs uh, for statistical data in various sectors, but statistical authorities are not always in a position to produce any statistics according to the wishes that the users have, you know. Uh, users should be encouraged to identify their own priorities. Therefore, a regular user-producer um, dialogue is to be established to monitor changing needs of users. Additionally, a number of new indicators should be developed based on uh, close cooperation with uh, respective stakeholders. Uh, in terms of second uh, question, uh, I would say that in order to promote the use of statistics to ensure better, better data for SDGs, um, for decision-making and policy execution, um, it is important to identify the uh, barriers as well as to establish the uh, sustainable and inclusive engagement for all parties. Uh, the government and national statistics offices regularly face a number of um, barriers that hinder data use. Uh, these are uh, um, actually domestic data barriers, stakeholder capacity, and institutional incentives for data use. Uh, also data cultures and resource barriers. Among them, I'd like to highlight the most common and uh, uh, challenging barriers. Uh, those are um, inconsistent data quality, uh, insufficient communication between the producers and users, also unclear understanding of data use among the users and the lack of skills among um, the uh, producers. Also the lack of trust in official statistics in no towards it. Uh, various measures have been already taken by uh, the National Statistics Office of Georgia Geostat to address those challenges in terms of ensuring high quality of data. Uh, Geostat uh, gradually improved data collection, uh, processing, and dissemination methods by establishing modern technologies and using alternative data sources. Uh, also, in order to avoid uh, miscommunication with uh, users, Geostat regularly uh, uh, fosters communication with the relevant stakeholders and data users. Uh, promoting the use of statistics, intensive cooperation with uh, the media, active dialogue with users, and study and analysis of their needs and requirements are top priorities for Geostat. In addition, during last year, Geostat uh, conducted multiple training with different uh, data user groups in order to improve uh, literacy in statistics, uh, promote its use, 
and decision making, increase credibility and uh, develop trust in official statistics. Uh, as for uh, second question, um, uh, it is essential for states to develop a strategic approach to stakeholder engagement, you know, uh, strengthening uh, the national cooperation mechanism with the stakeholders uh, is a top priority in terms of effective and sustainable data use. Um, efforts toward achieving the SDGs depend on the ability to engage with multiple partners from uh, different sectors and society. Uh, sustainable development networks are founded uh, to share values and voluntary to collaborative relationships in which all participants agree to work together uh, to achieve a common purpose. Actually, uh, when stakeholders are actively engaged in the planning, also in uh, creation and support of the statistical data, the sustainability is increased and uh, common goals among um, different uh, interest groups are established. Uh, the communication are improved and the system is built with the user needs at the center. So working together, uh, these groups or individuals have the power to create and foster more and more data systems uh, from the states of collection through use and reuse in decision making uh, that unlock actually the power of data for all people. And uh, a few words about uh, last question. Uh, in 2019, uh, Geostat, with the support of UNDP, and uh, international and local experts develop the strategy of national statistical system for the next four years. The aim of the strategy is uh, actually to create a more uh, efficient and transparent system for the collection, processing, analysis, and dissemination of statistics in the country, and therefore uh, uh, to establish an effective dialogue with users and improve um, their literacy in official statistics. In this regard, despite the pandemic in 2021, uh, Geostat was actively collaborating uh, with the users and conducted uh, um, uh, numerous trainings, workshops, and meetings with users of statistical data, as well as with owners of administrative data sources. Thematic workshops with uh, various target groups were held uh, regularly during the year, as well as meetings with representatives of international uh, institutions. Um, uh, I would like to mention that these activities helped uh, participants uh, to um, advance their knowledge on official statistics and methodologies used by uh, us as producers of official statistics, uh, as well as uh, to have the information on the latest product developed by Geostat, new services, and future plans. Uh, so as a result, those activities uh, ensured the improvement of the analytical and data pro processing skills of uh, participants, identified the basic needs of the users, and facilitated the promotion of the use of statistics in order to avoid misinterpretation of official statistics to support evidence-based decision-making and policy execution. Uh, also, it is worth to mention that similar activities are planned during uh, this year as well. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, wish you constructing and highly successful uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Todorozze. I think it was uh, really, really uh, interesting to hear all the efforts that you've made in terms of uh, data literacy and improving data skills uh, in, in 
Georgia, but also the emphasis that you put on the food purchase and engagement, a way to reach sustainability uh, in data use. So that, that was very, very interesting. And I think we will get back to that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we now move to our next panelist, Mr. Karan Nakpal. So we have heard from the National Statistical Office. Now we move into uh, civil society because Mr. Karan Nakpal is an associate director and economist at the ID Insight, which is based in New Delhi, India. He leads the ID Insights partnership with the Delhi government on outcome focused governance, as well as its partnership with the Indian government on reforming capacity building in the civil service. So we will now get a bit of an outsider perspective on how can we can embed the data use in, in government decision making. Um, the floor is yours and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much, Martina, and thanks uh, to all the other panelists uh, for some very interesting views on uh, what uh, Mongolia and Georgia are doing. Uh, to improve the use of uh, administrative data. Uh, <clears throat> Martina has already introduced me, uh, so I won't say more, but I think I, you know, this is obviously uh, the, the topic of the conversation is, is uh, super relevant because this was the founding premise for our organization was how do we actually get data to be used by decision makers, whether they be in governments or NGOs. Uh, and so ID Insight is a global organization with offices in uh, several countries in Africa, uh, in India and in Manila. Uh, and a lot of our work is with NGOs, governments, both national and subnational around thinking about, uh, you know, what types of data uh, do decision makers care about? How should that be collected and how should that then be used? Uh, how can it be used uh, in, uh, uh, you know, to actually improve the way budgets are allocated, to improve the way other resources are allocated, and to improve the uh, implementation of the programs themselves with the ultimate goal that you know that that use of that data uh, that things the way things happen today uh, isn't ideal and you know if data was if structured data was more used then the decisions would be taken in such a way that government programs would benefit more people uh, and so you know it's incredible uh, to be able to participate in this type of conversation I think I will keep my remarks on two sort of uh, stages of the data process. One is on the data collection side of things, uh, and the second is on data use. Uh, on data collection, uh, I think a lot of uh, you know improvement and a lot of uh, suggestions have been made as part of this data values project around how to give uh, you know individuals much more agency in the use of that data. I think. At ID Insight, we have recently launched uh, something called the Dignity Initiative, uh, led by my colleague Tom, who's based in our Nairobi office, uh, and that sort of encourages, you know, multilateral organizations, governments, uh, and anyone else collecting data to think much more beyond, uh, you know, agency in the way that it's been captured in the Data Values Project. That's a good starting point. But I think, the, you know, uh, I, I think our emphasis is, you know much more around thinking through just what the experience of data collection feels like to uh, individuals uh, whose data is being collected in that process. Now, uh, you know, this, when a response, when an enumerator comes to your house and asks you questions about your, your priorities or whether you have received a particular scheme or not, or your outcomes, I think it's a really cru crucial point of almost citizen making in, you know, your ability to participate in that process. It is one of the only opportunities that many individuals have to share their exp life experiences with the government. And often it doesn't feel like that. Often it feels like a much more uh, regimented exercise where, you know, someone's come and, you know, your life experiences must be put into down these buckets. I think a lot of uh, more effort we are trying to do in our organization because we do a lot of data collection ourselves and, in, you know, amongst our partner organizations is to train enumerators in giving people that sense of participation, you know, that sense of respect when they are participating in that exercise, uh, going beyond agency to, uh, you know, giving them a sense of being heard, you know, when data collection happens. Uh, and this, you know, requires a lot more thinking that we are also doing around what it means for consent, you know, how can consent be done in a way that both is formally correct and legalistically correct, but also, you know, truly gives people the sense that, you know, that they have consented to this exercise. How can we be more respectful to uh, individuals whose data is being collected during the, you know, during the 
process of data collection and then of course at the end of you know how does this data go back to the individuals how does it continue to give them a sense that look i participated in this exercise and i gave my time to this you know enumerator and something came of it some you know somebody you know was able to in this aggregate form uh, here that you know what what i feel what i think what i do uh, and i think that closing of the loop doesn't often happen and i think there's a lot of agreement on that that should happen and i think we are trying to put in place more practical ways in that in which that can happen the second thing is around data use i think you know uh, uh, a lot of our effort in our uh, partnerships with governments in india uh, and in africa has been around how do we produce data that is actually used by uh, ministers and you know permanent secretary equivalents heads of departments in government um and i think what you know many of these things have been touched upon so far uh, what i have learned through my four year journey of making this happen and what id insight has learned through its 10 year journey of making this happen has been that you know data is useful when it is created to answer the right questions uh often data is not used because the because the minister or the permanent secretary cares about things that the data is not answering so uh, you know uh, national statistics are very good at capturing outcomes so you know, they'll tell you things like health outcomes they'll tell you things like learning outcomes or incomes but often that's not the level that ministers let's say are interested in they you know if they are responsible for delivering schemes or programs they want to know how that implementation is happening and they want to know what people think about that implementation and of course outcomes i think a lot of ministers would say that you know outcomes matter but outcomes matter in the long run right now the information i want is every week i don't want to know what the income levels are every week i want to know whether this subsidy i'm dispersing or this program you know program i have created whether that is getting the uptake or not i think that's you know that's some, what some people will want some other ministers may want much more regular outcomes data so i think a lot of times there's a mismatch between what it is that the minister and a permanent secretary is looking for and what national statistics are able to provide them in that moment so i think you know nso's uh, national statistics offices can do a lot more thinking around how can they become better at trying to understand what it is that the decision makers want and you know creating uh, that type of data i think a lot of what we have learned in our process is that whenever minister says hey i want my dream list is these four things often the answer that is actually that data doesn't exist and needs to now be created so i think uh, you know i think that is one reason why data is used is because it's you know or to frame it in a more positive way data is useful when it is created to answer the right questions second is of course i think you know everyone here has already spoken about timeliness uh, frequency is very important often we underestimate just what uh, you know frequent means so in my conversations with state or national statistical authorities in india you know when when we when 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 they say timely they mean you know less you know uh, you know less than annual so you know maybe every month maybe every quarter maybe every six months is timely but for a minister it's you know uh, or or a permanent secretary it's every day or it's every week so i think a lot of resources are required to kind of put in place systems that actually can generate that level of frequency but for it to be useful for any data to be useful it has to be that frequent that involves often hard trade offs about you know there are things that we think decision makers should care about but those are things that decision makers today don't care about and so i think a lot of this is balancing what it is that people want to use at what frequency is important and the third thing is you know a lot around visualization and how data is presented i think uh, uh, you know one of the challenges with data administrative data or official data in government systems is that it's presented in a much more static format in tables uh, and it's very difficult for uh, you know people like ministers or senior bureaucrats who have very little time and very small attention span often because they have a lot of going on they want to be able to get a very quick picture of what this number means across time across space and i think those type of visualizations those have presentations that are often not available to them so a lot of what we are now trying to do is figure out what type of you know presentation would actually make more sense so that it can then make problems make challenges more salient uh the make uh, to 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 the minister uh, or to a uh, to a senior bureaucrat and that they are then able to solve that problem uh, 
I think the fourth thing, so, you know, I've spoken about three, right? When is data useful? It's useful when it's created to answer the right questions, whether it's an input or an output or an outcome. It's at the right frequency. It's at, you know, using the right visualizations. I think the fourth thing is uh, a degree of agility and iterativeness. I think uh, one of the challenges that we have experienced and are trying to solve for is that, you know, senior bureaucrats and senior politicians, their priorities. Governance is a very, you know, daily evolving thing. I think priorities change very regularly. Often data systems are much slower to adapt in response to those changing priorities. And so what ends up happening often uh, is that, you know, the data system is saying one thing, but the minister knows that that number is wrong because, you know, they have much better ground level information on that number. And so therefore they are like, oh yeah, I can't be bothered to actually, you know, improve this data system because, you know, that's, I know how many schools are there in my state. I know how many students are enrolled in my state. And if the data system is not giving me that answer, then, you know, it's not I am wrong. It's the data system that's wrong. And often that's the case, right? Because data systems require a lot of human investment and in actually upgrading, updating, you know, response options. Sometimes when you design the system, you thought that, you know, there were only four potential states of the world. And as it goes, you know, through the real world, you know, uh, you, it turns out that actually you need to have six response options, not four. And it's actually very hard to change that in real time. So I think a lot of what we are trying to do is create data systems that are able to, you know, meet these changing priorities that change very frequently. Uh, I think with that, uh, I would, you know, it is, it is, it is a big challenge. You know, it is true that uh, there is a lot of data out there that is today not being used. Uh, and uh, I do hope sincerely that this project goes a long way uh, through these conversations and through these outputs in uh, creating very practical, tactical steps for uh, organizations like us and for governments and for, you know, uh, you know, organizations like National, National Statistics Office to produce data that's a lot more, uh, uh, you know, likely to be used to improve lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. I think it was very, very nice to hear from you about the importance also of um, participation, inclusion and uh, and like working on very effective way of gathering consent and informed consent on the data collection side, plus all the insights that you shared on the on the data use. Uh, from what I hear from you, I also see some connection with the presentation uh, we had earlier uh, from Mr. Radze on the necessity to have user-producer dialogue and making sure that there is an alignment between what is produced and what is needed, which is, which is currently like one of the key for data use. So these are all very, very important points. I think we'll go back to the visualization and the agility points as well. Um, but before we go into the Q&A mode, I would like to give the floor to Shruti. Uh, Shruti, I already introduced her and she gave this amazing presentation on Data Values Project. If she wants, if Shruti, you want to share a few insights on the questions that are on the screen, from your experience as a private sector uh, and then we can go into the Q&A and if if you haven't posted your questions yet I invite you to do so uh, we will be going in Q&A mode uh, in a few seconds but Trudy if you want to uh, jump in the floor is yours. Sure thanks Martina and you know the challenge of coming in the end of such a fantastic panel is all the great points have already been made so in some ways I feel I will be echoing what those before me have said uh, but I do want to quickly touch upon two important or what seems strike me as incredibly important points first is this idea that both Mr. Patmunk and Mr. Gugita highlighted which is that more collaboration is required and more user producer dialogue is required I think often in data collection I find this strange silos where data is collected by someone it's analyzed by somebody else like let's say the statistical office and it's used by bureaucrats by ministers and so there is no cohesiveness to who is collecting the data who is analyzing the data and who is then using the data and for what are they using the data building dialogue between these different and what at times are disparate actors within the data ecosystem is absolutely crucial. Often data collectors are also the users of the data. So several instances where we've seen frontline village workers or frontline health workers who are collecting the data, who if 
we worked with them more to talk about data use could actually use this data that they're collecting to inform better health decisions or better planning decisions within the village that they are serving. But because we see data collection, data analysis and data use as distinct functions and don't talk enough about overlap and collaboration between these, I think we miss out on a lot of opportunity to truly highlight the value of data to use data uh, in different in daily local decision making and not just at a policy level by the Minister of Environment or the Minister of Health, but really by the many officials who make up governments in this countries and who are every day making decisions around governance, around service delivery, around planning. So one, uh, I mean, that really is my main hope for how we improve data use, especially within the government, is talking more clearly across the data collection, production, analysis, and use ecosystem. The second bit that I uh, also within this framework that I want to talk about is being more clear about what are the specific data points that would be useful. Uh, again, this is something that Karan mentioned that data is helpful. Data will help policy making is something that's often heard, but there's less clarity on the specific use of individual data sources. What are the decisions that this data is guiding? And often again, this can help data producers or data collectors collect better quality data if they have a better understanding of what it's going to be used for. And uh, it helps us collect more specific data and not waste everyone's time by collecting a whole bunch of data that we're never going to use. The second thing that I want to talk about is communicating and building incentives for data use. Often, you know, we think that, oh, we should build incentives for this, especially within governments and within the public sector. but there is a very good understanding of how to use data when the incentives are clear. So for example, one, uh, one use case that stands out all the time is the use of data for elections to predict how elections will be won or lost, how voting patterns will play out. And there's a very good understanding of this kind of data and its impact across the whole ecosystem. Whether it's someone who's a block officer, it's a higher level bureaucrat, it's a minister, there's a very good understanding of this data of these patterns and how to analyze and what how that can drive action. So I don't think this data use itself uh, is something separate that we need to teach or to teach different officers or to teach people within the government. I think people understand that. I think what we need to be more clear about is what are the incentives for using data? Why should I use data if I already know what will work? What can data teach me? What sort of decision making can it help? What can it help improve? Uh, and I think we aren't clear enough about that. Often data is just like data will help decision making. It's a very generic statement but we need to get more specific about it. We need to be able to be more clear on what the incentives are. And I'll just close with an example. At Athena, we work a lot with utilities in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and building data sharing and decision-making tools for them. And, you know, sometimes these tools can be built and they're nice on the website, but rarely used. But I think what we found works best is when we sit with city government officials and utilities and regulators to understand their incentives for data use, what kind of data would be useful for them, and then co-produce these data sharing systems, these decision making tools with them, understanding how this data can be used and what the incentives for using this data will be crucial and you know, I, I would love to see more conversations around that, around incentives and collaboration. And I think that will really help us build cultures of sustained, effective data use. Thank you, Martina, back to you. Thank you very much, Rudy. And thank you very much for sharing this. It's an interesting point. It's true that being the last is always very difficult, but yeah, you did an excellent job. And uh, I really like what you said about um, 
the um, the fact that there, there is someone collecting data, someone else analyzing them, and someone else using them, which makes sometimes it difficult to coordinate and ensure around the data values chain, but also the question on incentives for data use, which is definitely very, very important. Uh, I think we have a question for the chat, but before I go there, there was one question that was asked uh, in the registration form that I would like to ask to all of uh, our speaker. We have around 25 minutes, so we should be able to discuss uh, a few uh, other things as well as they come up. Uh, the question that we received from the registration form concerns the um, topic of the culture of use of data. And now we can, you know, convince and change the culture of decision makers within government to make them better um, educated and to make them understand the importance of using data. I think as Shruti said, in certain cases like election, the incentive for use of data uh, is such that they feel this is an important topic and they maybe go out. But is there a need for a cultural shift and how do we work with decision makers at a high level to uh, reinforce uh, the importance of data use uh, in, in their mind and in their work? Maybe we'll start with uh, Mr. Gogeta and then and then I'll pick up the panelist that goes after him next. Mr. Gogeta. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, actually, as we as we highlighted during our uh, panel discussion, uh, many many issues are actually challenging. However, quality of data, methodology, and not sufficient resources also are on the top of the list. Also, uh, wrong interpretation of the statistical data is challenging as a result of which uh, we statisticians uh, are very often the instrument for, um, uh, for political manipulation, you know? Um, all above mentioned demonstrate substantial need for development of national statistical system, which uh, actually require additional resources, better financing, finances and attraction of appropriate uh, human resources how we can um, uh, try to solve these problems. Um, I would highlight three main points. Uh, conduct uh, dialogue with policymakers and the government, define the role and responsibilities of relevant institutions in the, uh, involved in the system and improve communication at different levels. So uh, fostering good image and reputation uh, increase uh, credibility and developing a trust in statistics should be the main part of our priorities. And this is um, uh, this is a need to improve education of users of statistical information and explain them what is statistics and how to dealing with data. Thank you very much, Mr. Gujita. That was uh, very, very clear <laughs> you had very three very clear points on how, how we can do this better so thank you very much for sharing your insights maybe we can go next to mr batfa if he wants to take the floor and share a bit about the cultural change and how we can can do that <coughs> thank you very much martina a uh, very interesting question uh, with regards to the culture of change in use of data in uh, uh, policy makers, I think uh, for NSOs it will be uh, very important to proactively communicate the data to general public as well as the the policy makers. I think by communicating data, we can increase the awareness of data. So any decision uh, made by the policy makers shall be uh, evidence uh, checked or fact checked against the data that fish data that's, that has been released. So that's why uh, in our case, whenever there is a, a big debate among the, in, in the society about a certain topic, uh, uh, for example, if it's uh, about the uh, government budget or it's if it's about the uh, uh, the if it's about the social security or so social transfer issues, uh, we always try to uh, come up with uh, easy uh, data releases, including the uh, infogra infographics or some uh, reports which compares the 
data of the Mongolia uh, uh, with another countries and where we stand in terms of the uh, in certain topics. So I think uh, it really helps the public to you know uh, judge the, the positions of the the arguing parties uh, regarding that topics. And when the debate uh, goes to the parliament or the cabinet, the data or statistics are picked up for the additional used. And sometimes even they call the, the representatives from the NSO to participate in the cabinet meeting or the parliament to give the additional information. So I think uh, the proactive communication of data is important in installing the culture of change in the data uh, usage. And uh, secondly, uh, one thing that uh, we uh, or we try to uh, emphasize more is the timeliness of the data and granularity and the uh, disaggregated data. Because most of the time, if we look at the traditional, the way uh, we have been uh, compiling statistics is, is mostly it was like uh, aggregated data that we have been releasing. But now, uh, when the questions become more specific, or and uh, uh, when the policymakers need more specific data, they require uh, timely data with very disaggregated uh, uh, units. And uh, when, whenever there is uh, no official statistic uh, is available, then. Uh, uh, the government bodies look at the different ministries or different uh, agencies for the data, but uh, the quality issue is uh, sometimes the problem, creates a problem for us. So that's why uh, what we emphasize is the integrated, uh, the data ecosystem within countries shall be built and the uh, data governance issue as a national, at the national level must be discussed with the line ministries. That's what by doing that, we can uh, increase the quality of the data, as uh, Lugito mentioned. Uh, or the NSOs cannot produce all the data, but we can issue the, the, the at least uh, the data that is the admin data that has been get, gathered by the different um, agencies and ministries have some quality, which is good for the decision making. So uh, that that would be my answer to instill the culture of the data usage in the decision making. Thank you. Over Thank you very you. much. A very, very uh, a relevant points on, on communicating the data, being very proactive, and also this question of data ecosystem. I think we might go back to uh, the question of data ecosystem. But before we do, uh, Karan, Shruti, do you want to share your uh, experience in terms of building better data culture for, for decision makers? Uh, Karan, you go first and then Shruti. Uh, thank you, Martina. I think I will just like to go back to that point which Shruti had ended her remarks with around incentives for data use. I think, you know, uh, all of us sitting, you know, sort of on the supply side of data, as it were, you know, can think about data use culture or can, you know, critique the absence of data use culture for the lack of data use. But I think it's important to think about what is it that the data users want and like how it, do we strengthen those incentives for data use? I think what has been very useful and powerful for us in addition to uh, Shruti's point about co-creating that, uh, you know, output, what that data would look like, uh, is been uh, showing the value of actually using data. So, you know, I think, I think uh, creating, uh, you know, very simple case studies on, you know, how the data system or the data outputs, what I like to call the data use architecture, how this, you know, it could be a dashboard, it could be a regular weekly bulletin, it could be a WhatsApp message with a nice graph, it could be, uh, you know, a, a presentation that happens regularly, uh, how those outputs were able to make a problem salient or, you know, create like an early warning system where, you know, we were able to flag something the system was able to flag something earlier than you would have noticed it if you hadn't used the system. I think creating that type of, you know, uh, uh, reason for people to use the data is quite important. And I think, and I think, I think, you know, uh, one of our approaches when we work with governments is to find a few people who are intrinsically motivated to actually use data 
help them solve their problems and then use that to then say to more skeptical individuals to say look you know i hear you i know why you think this is not useful to you but here is how it can be useful and here is how it was useful for your other colleague minister or your other colleague permanent secretary so i think that has been our approach which has so far you know it's still work in action so you know i'll report back on you know more as uh, over the next few months and years as we go forward thank you very much very um, very interesting and practical insights on you know sh like really completely sh showing the value of using data and finding a few people motivated and building from them then you can actually embed more data use into the organization uh, shruti the floor is yours I'll keep this really quick because I think everybody before me has made some great points, but I think often we think of data use as like this really big thing. Like we're talking about statistics, AI, ML, blockchain, whatever you will, right? But actually we are all using data and making decisions every day in our life. Farmers in rural Kenya are using wind and weather patterns to decide what their harvest should be or to predict how large a harvest they will be. And they've been doing it for a very long time. Every day we look at Google Maps to, you know, map our route and see which would be the best road to take. So to sort of think of data use as something that we are all doing every day in very many different decisions in our life. And it's not this big external thing that we have to uh, suddenly develop a new orientation towards. Yes, there are certain skills and capacities that are needed, but we're all using data and making decisions in, in our personal and professional lives. What we have today is better quality data, better tools to understand data. So instead of knowing that, oh, between 9 to 10 a.m., there will be a lot of traffic on the ma in the main road in Chennai where I live, I can also look at Google maps which is giving me regular real-time data to understand what exactly are the traffic patterns and plan my route accordingly. So I think that's what better tools in collecting, analyzing data allows us to do. But data use is something that we all do intrinsically in our life. And we shouldn't, I mean, not we, but like in general, institutions and individuals shouldn't be scared of it. It's something that's intuitive to us but we just have better tools for data use these days. Thank you very much, Shruti, for reminding us that indeed we are uh, um, we are doing evidence-based decision making wherever in our lives when we decide which route we take uh, uh, for traffic reasons or uh, when we decide uh, around uh, other topics that are really like everyday life. Um, I think we have two questions from the audience, which I would like to merge. So. One question is around uh, the uh, national data ecosystem and the roles and the responsibilities of the different players in producing and using the data. So I think we've heard about coordinating with the line ministry. We have heard about, you know, uh, discussing between producers and users of, of data. I think the question is the audience, like the, the question from Jan is actually more about who is responsible for providing the data that is needed for development and, and having it used, or if not providing it, at least ensuring that a coordination exists between the different players. So this, go back, uh, this goes back to the question of, of the data ecosystem and how different uh, players uh, have a role in that. And link uh, to the question, there is a question around uh, examples of uh, best practices, because we've been speaking about barriers to data use and what goes wrong. But are there any example from your experience of things that went right? And, you know, there were data that was produced and was used by uh, decision maker, but also like journalists. I've heard you speaking about civil society businesses. So let's let's uh, set the record straight and share also some uh, uh, cases in which uh, there was actually poor data use. Uh, maybe we do the same order uh, as before. So, Mr. Todd, if you want to start, and then we will uh, move to the next panelist. Yeah. Um, what what I want to highlight, actually, national statistical offices are uh, professionally independent bodies, but uh, in most cases, they are not able to solve existing problems independently, you know? What I want to emphasize, there is a need for coordinated capacity building, 
cooperation and coordination between statisticians and policymakers need to be strengthened and statistical system need to be developed. Uh, from past experience, we also learned that communication between producers and users should take place at different levels, regular basis, you know. There is a need also to continue active cooperation and communication with policymakers and with owners of administrative data sources to ensure establishment of reliable and transparent statistical system. Thank you very much. And is there any example of a, a statistic that has been widely used or a good example of data use that you want to share with us? I think we might have missed. Maybe we lost Mr. Torreze, but we can go back to him. Uh, Mr. Badva, do you want to share about uh, how you're building a national data ecosystem and the governance of this ecosystem in Mongolia and your role in that? And uh, if you have a nice example of data use that you want to share. Thank you. So uh, starting from uh, last year, February, uh, the parliament has tasked the uh, the NSO of Mongolia to create an integrated national uh, database to link to all the different uh, admin data created by the government agencies to produce the official statistics as well as uh, support the evidence-based uh, decision making. So to uh, implement the project, we have been studying the case uh, experiences of the our colleagues uh, of uh, from the New Zealand and Switzerland and uh, what we have been uh, planning and doing so far is that uh, we have uh, we are giving a more emphasis on the national uh, data governance issue so here we are talking about who should be responsible for the, the data classification and co codes and who shall be responsible for the uh, digital enabling uh, technologies and etc. So in our case, by law on statistics, uh, the NSO is responsible for the, all the uh, all the classification and, and the codes so at the national level, so that the data created at the different uh, ministries can be interoperable. And we are talking with the national. Uh, Digital Minister uh, to you know enable the the uh, uh, infrastructure and the technological ways to uh, link all the status. And one of the things uh, that we have uh, been emphasizing whenever we meet with the different ministries to evaluate the data quality and the readiness, we always talk about uh, the data stewardship and then data committee that uh, each sector has uh, uh, created uh, under the system. So when, uh, whenever the data committee is ready and uh, we are trying to give them the specific training to uh, let them know what, what are the classification and codes and which ways the data shall be gathered, how they should be checking the data quality and etc. And uh, because this is an enormous work, we are trying to uh, start with the uh, the pilot uh, sectors, which is more, uh, if implemented, more uh, the more beneficial to the society or more the impact making in terms of the society. For example, we decided to st start with the minister of the Lab minister of labor and social security because uh, the labor ministry and social security ministry. Uh, Labor and Social Security Minister have uh, has a data for the, all the people who are receiving the social transfers and also the uh, social security. So uh, it helps us to create the foundation for the uh, basically uh, data for the all the citizen based data, which can be linked to the next ministry, which is important is the Minister of Education. So based on uh, we are trying to link these two data between the ministries to see how the education policy and, and, and ed education inequality is uh, affecting the uh, the success of people in the when uh, when they go into the labor market and etc 
And uh, uh, again, the most important thing what we found is that, that uh, the data quality must be improved at uh, each level of the uh, uh, government agencies. And most of the time when we start the project, the, the, the real goal of the government officials who are in the front line, in the front office who are collecting data, they didn't have the enough knowledge to correctly uh, the input the data or classify the data because they didn't know the importance of what they are doing, uh, the, this primary data inputs. So that's why the continuous training for those uh, participants of the what we call the national statistical system is very important to create a better ecosystem at the national level. Or to you, Martina. Thank you, Mr. Batva. Any example of effective data use you want to share? Otherwise, I can go back to you and I can go to Karen uh, in a second. Uh, the effective data use, uh, uh, I would like to uh, mention about two cases that we have worked uh, so far. The first one is the uh, the food stamp uh, program of uh, Mongolia. You know, the food stamp is uh, given to people who are extremely poor, who cannot uh, afford the, to meet their daily needs. And previously, the, there was a model-based, uh, you know, the uh, grading system which was done by the, uh, the local governors, whether the, the person is eligible for the food stamp or not. And uh, this uh, model had a lot of the criticism from the general public because the uh, general public criticized that some of the time uh, the local governors, governors used the food stamp program for the political purposes, for election purposes. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, starting from last uh, July, uh, together with the Minister of, of uh, Labor and the Social Security, we tried to create improve the model effectiveness by integrating the the model inputs with the admin data. For example, we integrated the model in inputs with the, the car ownership data, the land ownership data, and property ownership data, and also the social security data. And uh, we've seen that the model improved uh, quite significantly, uh, and we have so far deducted 8,875 people from the, the food program, because these people had like uh, quite a significant uh, property according to the admin data. Now uh, we are in the process of uh, negotiating with the central bank and other uh, institutions to exchange the data uh, to improve the data, the model effectiveness. The second uh, the case is the Minister of Education uh, uh, has proposed the parliament to uh, increase the, uh, I mean, the, improve the financing of the uh, primary schools, school uh, financing. Uh, the proposal is that they want to put the uh, Increase the increase the quality of the school uh, and teacher school performance between the city and countryside, city center, and the, and then some uh, uh, the lower income uh, settlement areas. And one of the things uh, that uh, we, with the help from the ATP, is trying to do is uh, uh, together with the ATP and the Minister of Education NSO, we have uh, agreed to start with the research called uh, the uh, factors of production of the education. So in that, uh, uh, we are trying to uh, link together dif different uh, admin data created, uh, for example, the education data, social security data, taxation data from the Minister of uh, Finance uh, to see the, what are the, are the most significant uh, variables which affects the quality of the uh, performance of the uh, students, whether it's the teacher experience, whether it's the school uh, investment or school utility, whether it's the the financing from the government budget, etc. To pin out 
in which areas the uh, Minister of Education shall be uh, focusing on when they are dealing with the different schools. So uh, we hope that by the end of the research, we will be able to you know, improve the, at least the financing scheme of the uh, education here in Mongolia. Over to you, Martina. Those were two great examples. Uh, thank you very much for sharing them with us. And thank you for also discussing the, the role that you're playing in the governance of the national data ecosystem and the, this important of linking different data sets. Uh, Karen, Shruti, do you want to go with, the, with those two questions? And then I think we will have just the time for some final remarks from all of you. But Karen, please go. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, one thing that we are trying to do uh, in India on this national data ecosystem uh, question is, uh, you know, uh, as speakers before me have said, you know, there's this matching of data across different ministries is very challenging. So I think uh, we are working with the Niti Aayog, which is India's uh, federal policy think tank, to put together something called the National Data Analytics Platform or portal. I forget what the P stands for. And the idea there is that, uh, you know, one of the challenges with using admin data and this I faced myself when I was doing my PhD in the subject was the fact that places and place names are different across different data sets and some this data are at the level of the village, some at hamlets, some above village and you know using different spellings and these things change over time and you know just creating like a comprehensive like one sort of list of place names is uh, been a challenge. So I think what we have now uh, done with many other organizations is put together this uh, easy to use platform that actually allows you to identify a place and you can get data about that place from many different data sets. Uh, and so that allows you to see incomes and agricultural outputs and, you know, uh, economic outcomes and a bunch of other outcomes together for one location. So if you care about that one location, say as the administrator of that location, you can get that data together. So I think that type of investment, uh, we are going to see if it's actually useful. We just have you know, going to launch this soon. Um, in terms of data use examples, two quick examples. One is we work with the Delhi government to help build their data system for COVID management. And I think a lot of this before the data system came in place was done in a very uh, unstructured ad hoc way and different data systems did not speak to each other. So one of the relevant parameters that the government cared about was what percentage of patients uh, who you know tested positive that day were not able to be traced by the surveillance uh, teams. Uh, that number was very hard to generate uh, easily because you know the district systems did not speak with the state systems and so being able to just surface that number to say that look x percent is the number of patients that were positive today but were not able to be contacted on the same day actually you know was super helpful for the senior level state administrators to then follow up more granularly with the surveillance teams and say okay look this is the number you are supposed to track and you know you haven't achieved it i think a lot of it was just being told that this was being monitored created a big incentive change amongst the surveillance teams and that they knew that their bosses were looking at this number regularly and therefore it, you know we saw a uh, dramatic decrease in that percentage once the data system came into place. And then the second one, you know, example speaks to this ability of formal data systems to, you know, uh, be left, you know, intersect with like informal or, you know, sort of what we know about the place uh, because we live there, uh, you know, these narratives and anecdotes and how those two come together. So one of the facts about Delhi is that the proportion of children that are born in uh, non institutions, so, you know, uh, Indian government wants every child to be born in, an, you know, in, in, a, in a proper, you know, in, in an institution, so not at home, but in a hospital or in a maternal facility. Uh, that number, the number of deliveries, uh, child deliveries that are not in an institution, is, you know, uh, is very small for Delhi, but it's not zero. And so the Delhi leadership cares a lot about why is this number not zero? Because everyone in Delhi should have access. It's a city, you know, with a lot of medical facilities. Who are these people who are still not being able to? Uh, get access to healthcare when they need to deliver, uh, when they need to deliver. And so I think that number become, became salient to the relevant ministers who then were like, okay, why is this number so high, guys? What's going on? 
and then in the conversation it uh, you know arose that okay actually the number is high because children are being born in like nursing homes and smaller hospitals that are not registered as part of the official system so it counts as a non institutional birth but they're still getting the right care and in addition the problem is there concentrated in certain parts of delhi and you know uh, the bureaucrat there had been there for 10 years and so she knew that oh you know we had done a study 7 years ago that had actually flagged that this area was where people had like you know uh, pregnant women had very low access to uh, care when they wanted and so that you know surfaced to the minister who then took decisions on how to you know prioritize where the future health facilities will be located maternal health facilities will be located so it was very powerful in that you know that number came up through the formal data system but the institutional knowledge of the bureaucrats in the room as well as you know what people knew how data is actually collected was helpful in actually shedding light on where in delhi this problem was the most important and then that number was then used to prioritize the rollout of future facilities thank you very much karen very very relevant examples and very impactful uh, both of them uh, on very important matters health related uh, shruti i think you have one minute and then let's see if i can uh, take 30 seconds more from each of our panelists and participants for final remarks sure i'll just talk about an example of data use uh, and i want to take talk about an example of data use from citizens and communities because everyone else has spoken about the government and the uh, The example that always stands out to me is the Right to Information Act in India, which came out in 2005 and empowered cities citizens to demand information from public authorities and public institutions. What this act did do in its early years at least was allow citizens to access data around benefits that were due to them around how public spending was being recorded, whether that aligned with their experience of public spending. if a record said they had received benefits uh had they actually received the benefits so empowered them to hold government accountable to approach courts for judicial redress and so how data use can be empowering for governments to make policy decisions but equally empowering for citizens and communities to promote greater transparency and accountability in policy making Thank you very much Shruti and sorry for cutting a bit your speaking time but we're getting to the end and I would like to hear from all of our panelists in 20 seconds a final remark on you know what do you think is the most important aspect of this discussion that you want to highlight so that our uh, participants leave with this uh, these important aspects really clear in their mind and then I will really close in 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 20 seconds myself so we don't go too late uh, but Mr. Tadze if you want to go first with uh, your most important remark from today thank you very much so um, it is up to us how we address current challenges you know deal with needs and opportunities it depends absolutely on us how we do it individually or as a part of international community we should not evoke uh, we should not only evoke the past but also we need commit all our efforts to the practical ways for development of our joint activities so nso should play more active coordinating role in the process because they are more familiar with statistical and analytical tools you know they speak the language of numbers and they know very well how dealing with data thank you very much it's again uh, amazing to hear this uh, incredibly important role of nso's and the point of being more proactive as well for for nso's to play a more active role mr batva the floor is yours thank you um mine is more more or less same uh Uh, I think the NSO should be, uh, NSO should be very proactive very in promoting proactive. the data usage and also the data literacy. And also, NSO should be the, at least in our case, uh, should be the one of the main uh, the player in promoting the data ecosystem uh, at the national level, so that the uh, uh, the data should be improved and usage should be improved. Thank you. two very important points as well uh, i really liked uh, the focus you put on the data ecosystem i'm sure that a lot of participants learned a lot uh, karen what's your final remark my final remark is that i'm very grateful that this project exists and is bringing together 
you know people who have been on this panel today as well as many many other stakeholders from many different sections of society and government to work together and figure out you know how it is that we can create much stronger incentives so that when data is collected it's collected in a way that truly respects and empowers the people in the communities about whom the data is being collected and then that data is used in a way to actually improve the lives of those individuals and those communities so i'm very grateful for this process and it's been a wonderful uh, uh time listening to all of you and you know as an organization we would you know we really commit and you know endorse this sort of mission of you know making data much more useful uh for improving lives in the world thank you very much karen and last but not but not least shruti thank you I think for me, what's clear both through the work that we've done over the past year, uh, other projects that we worked on and this conversation is this conversation around data use is not going away. It's going to become more urgent, more important, uh, more pervasive. Um, and I think what what this uh, project and what these conversations give us an opportunity to do is think about this culture of data use that we want to build and think about incentives for data use why should we be using why should we be using data and should we ever discard data should we say hey this data might exist it might show us something but it's not going to help us make the right decision so thinking more critically about data use and what sort of cultures around data use we want to develop and also accepting that this conversation is just going to become bigger, more urgent, and we should be talking about data use every day, whether it's to plan our route to the office or whether it's to think about health systems decisions in the government of Delhi. Thank you very much, Shruti, and I would like to really warmly thank all our panelists who have done an amazing job today. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I think we learned a lot from their experience. It was really great. Um, I would like to remind you that the recording and the slides from today will be available on the Stats Cafe website after uh, we close and just invite you again to have a look at the uh, public consultation on the Data Values project if you're interested in sharing your feedback on how we can embed data use uh, in the data for development world. Please have a look and we will look forward to hearing from you and uh, um, having your insights. So thank you very much again to everybody who joined today. Thank you very much again to all our speakers. I hope you have a very a nice rest of your afternoon, morning or evening and uh, speak, uh, speak soon. Thank you so much, Martina. Thank you for facilitating thank this you. very well. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Martina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.